Well, hello everyone. We will get started now and I'd like to virtually welcome you to UTS and our first panel in our new international online series, the UTS Media Salon, The Journalist and The Scholar. My name is Christine Carney and I'm a journalist and lecturer in digital journalism here at the University of Technology in Sydney. We have two very accomplished guests joining us today. Editor-in-Chief of The Guardian, Catherine Viner, and London School of Economics and Political Science Associate Professor, Dr. Sita Pena Gangadaran. But before I introduce them further, I'd like to make an acknowledgement of country. I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, upon whose ancestral lands our city campus now stands. I would also like to pay respect to the elders, both past and present, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this land. I would further like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various ancestral lands from which our other attendees join us today and to pay respects to those elders past and present. Now, I'm most excited to properly introduce our journalist and scholar today for our inaugural panel in this series, Confronting Crises on a Global Scale, fighting for change in the post-pandemic world. But before I do a little bit of housekeeping, I'd like to invite you all to use the hashtag UTS Media Salon uh, today and to please post any questions for the panelists into the Q&A box at any time as we move through the discussion. And I will have, we'll leave some time at the end to answer them. So, but please feel free to post any questions at any time. Okay, now I'm going to unshare my screen as I introduce our panelists properly and cue them in. Okay, so our first panelist is more than just a journalist. Catherine Viner has held the position of Editor-in-Chief of The Guardian since June 2015, after joining The Guardian as a writer in 1997. She was appointed Deputy Editor of The Guardian in 2008. She launched the award-winning Guardian Australia in 2013 and was also Editor of Guardian US based in New York. Catherine gave the 2013 A.N. Smith Lecture in Journalism at the University of Melbourne called The Rise of the Reader, discussing journalism in the age of the open web and a speech on truth and reality in a hyper-connected world as part of the Oxford University Women of Achievement Lecture Series in 2016. She is the winner of the 2017 Diario Madrid Prize for Journalism for her long read, How Technology Disrupted the Truth. And Catherine, I believe you have just returned from COP26 in Glasgow, and it's very early in the morning for you in London. So welcome, and I hope you have been able to have a cup of tea. Yeah, I was just toasting, uh, toasting you with an Australian style flat white this morning. So uh, <laughs> essential for this to, for the proceedings to take place. <laughs> <laughs> How we love a flat white here in Australia. Um, our second guest today is also more than just a scholar. Dr. Sita Pena Gengadaran is Associate Professor in the Department of Media and Communications at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Her work focuses on inclusion, exclusion and marginalisation, as well as questions around democracy, social justice and technological governance. She's also the visiting scholar in the School of Media Studies at the New School, affiliated um, fellow of Yale Law School's Information Society Project and affiliate fellow of the Data and Research, Data and Society Research Institute. She currently co-leads two projects, our Data Bodies, which examines the impact of data collection and data-driven technologies on marginalised communities in the US, and Justice, Equity and Technology, which explores impacts of data-driven technologies and infrastructures on European civil society. Before joining LSE, she was a Senior Research Fellow at New America's Open Technology Institute, addressing policies and practices related to digital inclusion, privacy, and big data. Her 2019 TED Talk is called Technologies of Control and Our Right of Refusal. And Sita, I know it's even earlier in the morning from where you are joining from in Boston. So I know you are probably needing far more than tea, some very strong coffee, I presume, and a very warm welcome to you too. 
Thank you so much. It's just water for me this morning. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, let's get going. Catherine, we might start with you. The very name for this panel is intended to follow up on a recent essay you wrote for The Guardian on how media can build a better world beyond COVID. Well, you pointed out the changes that have occurred throughout history after previous global upheavals. You quote various academics and writers suggesting the after effect of a global shock depends on the prevailing mood of the times. That, and I quote you here, positive changes do not automatically emerge from periods of crisis. You have to fight for them. So broadly speaking, could you expand on this? What's the current mood for change? And what kind of looming fights, so to speak, do we have on our hands? Well, I mean, I think there's quite a lot of fights on our hands. Um, uh, and, you know, I feel even when I, from when I wrote that, which was in uh, April, May, that uh, it's got even tougher. I think, you know, I think that what I was trying to get at is that I think we shouldn't just say we're going to return to the way things are and that should be our aspiration. The best thing out of the pandemic is we can get back to how things were. I don't think that should be our aspiration. You know, um, uh, it was pretty bad. It was pretty unequal. Um, and, you know, are we, are we just hoping to get back to that, but with more screens, because everyone spent longer with screens, but with more surveillance? Um, and I know that's something that CETA will, I'm sure, will be talking about as much more expert than me. You know, are we, is, that the, is that the best our aspiration, just get back to that? There were loads of things that were wrong with society. And I think, you know, we need to, um, you know, the, the right often see, you know, they, as Naomi Klein called it the shock doctrine, they see an opportunity in a crisis to um, take more power for themselves. I think it's important as well that, uh, that we sort of fight for the common good, you know, fight for public space um, and, and, you know, and put pressure on uh, all of these companies from fossil fuel companies, extractors, all the way uh, down to you know how we tax the super rich to try and fight for a for a better society. I admit it doesn't look like it's happening so much as I'd hope, but I still think uh, you never know how uh, things are going to end up, and you just have to keep you just have to keep fighting. And Catherine, I might just follow up here, follow up with you after that. Um, in the essay, you also speak of the pandemic in a positive light, and its effect of giving us fresh ideas and new energy. Um, for tackling these sort of looming crises. And as you've just noted, you quote warnings from the likes of Arundhati Roy and Naomi Klein, who said Grenfell was a rehearsal for COVID, just as COVID is a rehearsal for climate breakdown, if we don't radically change course. So how is the climate debate in COP26, where I know you just came from, an example or not of how we can learn from the pandemic to bring new global approaches? I know Boris Johnson said yesterday in his ongoing football match score of the climate emergency that the world is now down five to two or five to three, not five to one. So how can global solutions found for the pandemic, for example, inspire other looming crises such as climate, do you think? And it's so interesting, Boris Johnson has shown no interest in football throughout his uh, life and suddenly is using these slightly bewildering metaphors, but at least he is talking about the environment in a way that, I mean, he does seem to have um, had an epiphany. Let's see if it uh, affects his policies, because that's where, that's where it really matters. I mean, I guess, I mean, I would never say that, that I would describe the pandemic as a positive thing. I would never say uh, that, but, uh, um, but I think out of it, there was something where everybody just sort of stopped, right? Then, you know, the, those particular those few weeks in the UK, um, I know uh, more recently in, in some cities in Australia, the lockdowns just where everything stopped and with Oz, that inability to leave the country and so on, uh, the, the stopping of flying, the stopping of movement, the sort of thinking, well, what really matters? The fact that I can't see this person that I love, that's what matters most to me. It's not that I can't, uh, fly all around the world um, on vacation or that it's not that I can't uh, you know go out endlessly um, uh, in in sort of fossil fuel <laughs> driven fun um, you know it's sort of it's sort of and I think all of those things and it sounds slightly naive when you say it but I really felt it those that those few weeks of sort of silence and birdsong and how so many people uh, 
found solace in nature and sort of really noticed nature for the first time. There was all that great stuff about birdsong actually getting louder. It wasn't just that it felt loud, that it got louder because everything else was so quiet. And I think the stuff to learn in that, that's deep pleasure that people got from that. You know, that was incredibly beautiful, rewarding connections with nature, connections with each other, who we really missed, what, what really it felt like emotionally. And, um, um, and so I think we need to try and get some of that into our public policies rather than this, this endless quest for more growth, more consumption, more everything. Okay, great. And so public policy is possibly one of the looming crises. Um, Sita, I might bring you in here as we talk about sort of big picture ideas during and coming out of the pandemic. Um, Catherine cites in her essay, academics who call this the first worldwide digi digitally witnessed pandemic. And indeed, you're an expert in digital spheres and have championed equality in the digital world. So what are your views on technology's impact or role during the pandemic? And again, broadly speaking, how can we learn from this to help us with any looming crisis or crises that you might see? At 10 past four, <laughs> quarter past four in the morning, I, I want to try and strike a somewhat optimistic note, but I can say very genuinely that um, from where I stand in the research that I do and the work that I do in collaboration with many communities, both in Europe and in the United States, um, things do really honestly feel quite grim. Um, for example, here in the US, um, I'm very much uh, a part of the conversations around how to rein in the power of big tech. And, um, you know, as um, Jeff Bezos is going out into outer space, right, it's, it's almost as if uh, to build on that metaphor of, of um, movement that you alluded to, Catherine, just thinking about how we, we are seeing the most extreme um, wealth disparity of our time being manifest in this journey to outer space, while um, many people, many populations will be um, further entrenched, stuck in their places and spaces as a result of the pandemic. And so what I um, have sort of arrived at is in our interactions with tech, our, our relationship to technology has, I think, very much transformed in this, um, in, in the <laughs> darkest months of the pandemic, um, partly because we were able to see the tools that many of us have come to understand as information and communication tools as fundamentally surveillance and extractive tools, both surveillance, you know, whether that's um, tied to your workplace, monitoring your performance um, throughout the day, throughout the workday, or if it's um, the use of technology. I mean, for many populations, right, the, the surveillance use of technology is sort of par for the course, but for um, everyday citizens and everyday consumers, I think this sort of sense of uh, actually, I'm on a screen for far longer than I would have enjoyed. And uh, what's, what's happening on the other side of that screen. And so I feel like we're at an inflection point where for, you know, 25 odd years, we've been uh, we've had this understanding of technology being a democratizing tool. And it has felt like in the last year and a half, almost two years now, that technology, at least these communicative technologies, have really become disciplinary technologies. And again, the, the, the sheer wealth that has accumulated um, by Amazon, Alphabet, Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, right, and the myriad companies that are lesser known, um, but provide our computation or keep our computational infrastructure running, right, that there's something 
grossly uh, awry here. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm at a moment where it's, it's still sort of exciting to build on some of the organizing and sort of um, uh, collective action that we saw over the last year and a half that we saw over almost the last two years. Um, but at the same time, um, there's certainly a lot of work to be done. So, um, yeah. Well, Sita, I might just follow up with you there as you speak of big tech. Um, you know, you do speak of it routinely, how it uses dark strategies to lure us in. And, you know, solutions are not just about changing rules to enforce better algorithms. Um, but about bigger solutions and perhaps rejecting what's currently on offer. I've heard you say that and, you know, that the internet of the 1990s is very different from today. That you once believed in the power of the internet for greater inclusion and equality, but now you study how it enforces inequality. So how do we move forward to make sure people are getting access to good information and other digital benefits, for example? and that companies, as you often note, are not exacerbating this cycle of disadvantage that you talk about? I think there's two things. Um, one, I mean, I'll come back to a point, I think, in Catherine's essay from May, which is um, this point about empathy. <laughs> and uh, m many of us are steeped within a sort of filter-based, um, you know, uh, agglomeration driven type of communicative environment right we're part of social media so there's in that culture a sort of inbuilt insularity that happens and the sort of common understanding of each other has i mean that that's become difficult that to a certain extent that some of that melted away with the pandemic right um this feeling that actually <laughs> the person not only Am I going to take time to learn my neighbor's name? Um, but my neighbor is actually experiencing the same thing as I am experiencing. And, and that is incredibly important, important, right? This idea that actually, oh, yes, we do live on this planet together. And <laughs> there are some things that we have to work out together. Um, so um, th there's that aspect. But yes, at the same time, um we've sort of evolved a lobbying culture um a game of politics that have really put um, technology companies in the driver's seat to the extent that um, whether it's for the development of health applications or um, educational provision or um, public safety right we've even state institutions have become more dependent on these technology companies. So what do we need to do? We need to really inspect, um, you know, we need a moment of introspection to sort of reflect on whether the path that has been laid before us in terms of technological development and technological deployment and use is the one that we want, or whether we need to use not just antitrust um, or competition tools to intervene in the power that technology companies have acquired, but all of the tools that are, are at our disposal to really um, kind of reroute our understanding uh, and our relationship to technology so that it's not this disciplinary, right? I'm going to punish you because you are not in the system correctly as you move through one country to another or, you know, as you move through your workday, et cetera. It's actually to, to renew that sensibility of uh, or that democratic democratic sensibility that that um, we we have come to expect of our technologies. Yeah, um, Catherine, I might like to bring you back in here now as Sita talks about big tech, um, because you also noted in your essay the former Guardian editor C.P. Scott, who talks about a newspaper not just as a media business but as an institution, which should influence the whole community and has a moral as well as material existence. So. 
I'm wondering, as Sita talks about the impact of tech, what about the impact of tech on media? How do you think mainstream media can better influence this whole community, especially when competing so heavily for communities with tech companies now, including the likes of Facebook, or should I say Meta? And how can traditional or mainstream media compete with big tech who are not as beholden to the media standards or ethics and moral values that C.P. Scott talked about? I mean, I love C.P. Scott. Um, he was, uh, I was about to say he was editor for 100 years. He was actually editor for 57 years. So, my, and, uh, you know, was an absolutely uh, visionary editor. He wrote an essay in 1921 that is unbelievably astute when you read it now. Um, but I particularly love, at the moment, I'm very, I, I read him all the time, but this line about newspapers having a moral as well as a material existence. And I would just love big tech to sit down and really think about what that would mean. For them and um you know Sita talked about sort of the anti the limits of the sort of antitrust um uh point and i really agree with that you know this focus is always on breaking up big tech making them smaller and that obviously uh is a, an important idea but it's not just about the signs it's about what they do and how they behave you know if um you know if you're talking about sort of the um unseen prejudices buried in the um, algorithms um, all the way through to um, the thing that I worry about the most, which is how um, the business model, particularly of Facebook, uh, drives people into um, extreme positions very, very quickly. There's been some incredible research about how quickly you are taken from, uh, from quite mild uh, content uh, to quite extreme um, uh, content. And, you know, I think <clears throat> we, news organisations take responsibility for what we publish. Now, not all of them might do that to the extent we might wish, um, 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 but um, the good ones do. And, um, and I think the, the, the idea of, you know, big technology realising that, that, what they, that what they publish, they have something to do with it. They haven't just sort of passively provided a space. They've instead built um, you know, some of the most profitable biz businesses ever seen on the planet out of, uh, out of their uh, technologies. And, um, you know, they could earn a bit less money and uh, have a bit more moral uh, existence. Exactly, Catherine, because I know you've, just to follow up with you, I know you've talked about how technology has disrupted truth in another piece of, a couple of years ago. Um, and misinformation and social media and tech's influence over democracy. And of course, we've had the Cambridge Analytica scandal and many others before and since. Um, and you've also pointed out how many, how reporters, you know, have done great work during the pandemic in reporting reliable and truthful information. Um, but I'm thinking about a quote again here from you that the digital revolution might change how we interpret journalism's mission for the modern age. So audiences um, are no longer as separate from journalists. We have a global one and it lives, as you say, in polarizing spheres. So how do we get journalists, you know, how do journalists capture this polarized audience? And we often talk about trust, building trust. How do journalists build trust with those who have lost it in institutions, including media ones, which we have seen during the pandemic? What do you think about that? I think I think I think it is a very big uh, challenge for for journalists, um, and partly because the kind of um, you know the sea you swim in has changed so much. It has become um, you know in your Facebook feed, for example, you can't tell whether something is from a reputable source that is transparently funded and um, and will correct its mistakes, or whether it's just some junk website that's just trying to get clicks for cash or whether it's from prop some propagandist um paid for by a state or some other actor who is out to influence the um the scene for for worse so um i think then that's you know we may be angry with technology companies for that but it also puts greater pressure on us to uh be trusted now i do think the pandemic has um driven uh uh, audiences back to sites they trust. I mean, I think they, you know, when they want valuable information about how to protect themselves 
from uh, the virus, then they are going to go to more reputable sites. And I think that's probably why um, there's been such gigantic audiences to reputable sites like The Guardian and many others, the BBC, the ABC, um, over, over the pandemic. Um, you know, communities need good information. And in a pandemic, misinformation is even more dangerous than it was before. It, you know, it used to be that misinformation just meant that your, your weird cousin got completely obsessed with conspiracy theories. Now it's, it means, you know, it's deadly, right? They, they, um, uh, it, it, could res it could result in um, something very serious. So I think um, misinformation has become, has become deadly. And I think, um, you know, um, it puts greater pressure on journalists to um, sort of earn their trust. So I think, you know, some of the things I often um, talk about, about, um, is that I think journalists need to be part of the communities we report on. I think historically, um, or perhaps in the recent past anyway, um, that be, and I think print did this, it meant, you know, if you were just publishing by a newspaper once a day or a few editions in the evening, then you would give down, you, here, is, here is what I know, here is what I think, you grateful, grateful population, go read it, and um, you can write a letter if you like. But, and I think the now the way that it's um, it's a much more interactive experience for better and for worse. Uh, you know, I do think that it's beholden on journalists to be um, not just accountable, but also part of the communities we report on. So, um, and that leads to why it's so much more important for newsrooms to be much more diverse than they were in the past. You know, if if we're going to report on what's happening in communities, um, we should have teams that are from those communities partly because you know what you define as news I, I find something i find very interesting is when you talk to different communities about what they consider newsworthy it's really different they all really have strong views on it they all really have a strong sense of what is newsworthy but it's all really different so if you just hire a group of people from the same narrow stretch of society you get exactly the same view of what's news so you know you could i, I sometimes joke that the best argument for, for diversity is um is because it's it um, makes your news coverage far less boring you know there's so many more interesting things to talk about when you've got people bringing in things from all different places i think that makes you trust trusted i think when communities see things that are important to them not being reported then they start they they lack trust you know um in in the institutions um and I think there's also some interesting stuff about understanding the value of journalism as distinct from activism. You know, it's really, really important that um, we report things uh, that are true, um, even if we don't like them. You know, an activist will might ignore facts they don't like, but uh, you know, journalists have to tell the whole story in in a, as straight a way as possible. Um, I think. Very true about. Um diversity uh, and how to build trust in audiences. And Sita, I'm wondering, you know, we talk about ethics and ideals in media standards. And what about post COVID digital ethics, which is something that you think about obviously a lot. You've said, for example, that you worry about technological dependencies um, that are created once technologies are in place. And of course, we naturally think of tra tracer, track and trace apps that you've talked about. Are we on a path post COVID of normalizing this kind of technology? And what is, to quote you, the messy path versus a more responsible path ahead? You did mention this a little bit earlier. What kind of formal oversight might you recommend in terms of digital privacy? Noting even Facebook uh, in the last day announcing it's shutting down its facial recognition system. What, what do you think about um, the path ahead? Yes, again, at this early in the morning, I'm going to try and be more optimistic. It's too early to be dark. <laughs> um, but I guess, um, you know, I, I kind of want to come back to something that Catherine was saying about sort of the visibility of um, journalists and storytelling within communities and how important that is in general, right? Of all of the um, sort of public institutions uh, related to information and to a certain extent communication that probably is, has uh, um, escaped the pandemic um, 
in a, in a stable place has been the public library system, at least in the United States, right? The library is still a very trusted institution. People can lean on it to access the information that they need. It has a physical appearance in communities and not just a digital one, though in the United States and many um, of the um, big, bigger library systems, right? They're circulating digital devices and so forth to extend the library. And um, when I think about ethics, uh, I, I often think about the limitations of ethical practices, right? In the 1990s, there was a real push in the United States, especially to sort of cultivate these ethical practices within newsrooms, um, with ombudspersons, uh, in, 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 with respect to public journalism. And those are all really important, but the actual um, practice of storytelling in a community, I think, needs to be recognized and elevated in a way that it hasn't, right? It's really actually comforting for people to access the information that they need and also see themselves reflected in stories about their community rather than be cut off or excluded. And, um, you know, we're living in a time where uh, big tech has exceeded to a certain extent, big oil and, you know, other big <laughs> configurations of industry to the extent they, they have a presence in communities, right? They sponsor charitable events. They promise tens of thousands of new jobs in communities when they're setting up a fulfillment center or things of that nature. And um, journalists and media institutions don't necessarily, th that's difficult to keep pace with, right? Um, it's not as if I see the Guardian in my everyday existence when I'm in London, per se, right? Um, around me in my day-to-day -day interactions. And so I'm wondering if there's something there to think about um, that helps us uh, reposition the importance of information and, and narrative, right? It's not just the algorithm that matters to us, actually. It's that storytelling and that information gathering practice. And so it's more not, it, it, I guess my recommendations are not necessarily around thinking about um, sort of routines in the newsroom, um, but that intersection or that touch point between communities and media practitioners, because it's right, as we've been saying, we're in a highly polarized, uh, um, insular environment in many of our communication spaces. And so thinking about the practices that get us beyond that are really important. And I'd be curious to think about how um, and and um, come to understand how, for example, younger generations are interacting with the news and inf interacting with um, with journalism as the reputation of Facebook tanks, for example, right? That that desire to find information and to connect to one's community is inherent, I think, to our existence as humans, right? And so I, I feel like we probably have quite a bit to learn from young people just in terms of their their um, their news habits. Yes, and that the the what you were saying before about the importance of libraries, even as institutions, reminds me of a great Zadie Smith piece uh, written a couple of years ago. I mean, you might have read it, but um, just about libraries in the UK. Um, I just might like to remind everyone um, if you'd like to post any questions into our Q and A box. Um, I can see one coming in here. Please do so. Um, we have about five, five to ten minutes left in the um, in the webinar, so please feel free to type any questions into um, the Q and A box. And just before we go to those, Catherine, um, I might just follow up what Sita was saying there at the end in terms of young, um, you know, trying to attract young audiences. Uh, how does the Guardian 
go about trying to um, you know attract those under 30 under 25 under that sort of audience um, well we actually have a really uh, large number of um, uh, young readers and um, you know uh, and what I found is that you know you'll see sites that say oh they proudly say we are the website for young audiences or whatever and we always have more younger readers than they do and I think there's a couple of reasons for that I think one is because we're free I mean part of our uh, business model is that we say we're trying to we're trying to keep journalism good quality journalism available for everyone so that you don't have to uh, pay quite a lot of money which is a lot a lot of the, a lot of the news websites are quite expensive um, we encourage people who have got the money um, to pay so that other people can read it for free so I think that's a big driver but also and this is back to um, Sita's uh, really interesting point is that I think young people can see themselves in our reporting you know we have been focusing on the environment for a long time much longer than uh, Boris Johnson you know we were we were we were focusing on the book on uh, on the environment when uh, Boris Johnson was a climate denier so um, you know it's um, you know we, we, we focus on um, identity politics we focus on inequality we focus on you know um, a broad range of uh, pop culture internet culture and so on and so we and we have lots of, of um, young journalists as well so I think you know I think there's lots of reasons that people that young audiences find themselves in the Guardian and um, that's not to say though that um, you know um, I take that for granted and I think one something that I, I know to be true is that you know young audiences don't generally um, read uh, well, they don't read a newspaper very often or a complete experience. It's not like they will read the whole of everything on the Guardian's website or even the app. Although there is an editions app where it's all nicely contained. But, um, you know, they tend to sort of come in and out often from different platforms or from sharing with their friends and so on. And that means that they don't necessarily get the breadth of it of, of, of what we publish. And um, I think that's, that's not to do with the Guardian. That's to do with... Um, how the whole of the, the media has splintered. And I do think that's a democratic challenge as well. You know, if you find things that you don't think you're interested in, and perhaps you're not interested in, but uh, you know, are useful to you to know, um, I think that can be um, quite a specific uh, challenge for, for across the media. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so let's go to the Q&A. Um, we have Gordon, Gordon Farrer, who has asked a question here, and I think it goes uh, back to what we were talking about in terms of um, misinformation and a lack of trust in institutions. So Gordon says many communities, certainly in Australia, have been exposed as being unable to pull together in the face of the current uh, crisis, ongoing crisis, vaccine re resistance, freedom protests that doubled as super spreader events, health, in, health misinformation, all rooted in distrust of institutions, turbocharged by social media. Um, so he asks, can we pull together to solve the coming climate crisis when we can't even agree on a common set of facts as uh, during this uh, pandemic? Um, I'm not sure if either panellist would like to have a go at answering that? I mean, it's obviously a big and worrying challenge and we'll see what comes out of COP uh, on that. I would say though, that the one thing we do share is that we can all feel the impacts of the climate crisis. I think um, I, I'm, it was a particular moment uh, this uh, summer, the Northern Hemisphere summer, when um, British Columbia and uh, the west of Canada was having sort of, I think it was 45 degree heat. And everyone knows that BC is not a particularly hot area. And it was when, you know, Vancouver was burning and people were thinking Vancouver's burning. You know, it's not, it's like, I think people, you know, even people in the north are having to experience it. They assume it's it's going to be in the south, but it, it's going to hit them. You know, it's it, these floods in Germany. You no, know, and it's all these people dying in floods in Germany. And I and I think, I think surely once it heart starts to hit the rich in their day to day lives, um, when I say the rich, I mean the, I don't mean I mean the majority. I mean the north. Um, then then 
I do wonder if it, that shared experience might drive uh, collective action. Um, that's just, I'm trying to be optimistic there for the questioner. <laughs> Sita, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. I know you're in an optimistic time uh, mood. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I guess when I'm confronted with a really big question like this one, um, my answer tends to go towards, so where is that change and where is that pulling together already happening? And to use that as an example of uh, the possibility, the political possibilities that exist. So. Again, I do find it really heartening that young people are so engaged in climate issues. And um, I think contrary to some of how it's, some of the ways it's been framed in the media that it isn't all sort of apocalyptic um, ways of uh, anticipating the future. It's that actually um, it's, I wouldn't call it a pragmatism, it isn't climate pragmatism, <laughs> uh, but it is a sort of understanding uh, and a sensibility among young people that actually, yeah, <laughs> there, there is really no other option but to, to have um, coordinated action. And so, yeah, um, that's how I would respond. Is it going to be <laughs> easy? By um, no means will it happen overnight. I mean, this is generational change that we're talking about. And this is, um, I think Catherine mentioned, you know, this idea that consumption and growth aren't, uh, you know, these, um, it doesn't equate with progress, right? This kind of, industrial era notion of human progress really needs to be undone and so that's going to take several generations and again we have um communities not just young people but you know there are, are obviously um indigenous communities that have been speaking this uh for for generations right to really think about how we understand humanity and understand our relationship to the land and to um our planet. And I guess um, thinking about, you know, marginalised communities, it might take us to the next question from Chris Anthe, um, who asks, you know, it's, it's, it's spending time to gain the trust, again, trust of traditionally marginalised communities takes uh, resources. So um, how can journalists and newsrooms fight to create this time in a 24-7 news cycle um, we might go to you, Catherine, first, and I know, Sita, you're very much in touch with marginalised communities and your projects. Um, yeah, Catherine, if you have any thoughts on that. I, guess, I think that's just a question about where you put your resources. You know, I think um, um, one of the positive things in media in the last few years is that the shift away from the advertising driven model of funding to a reader driven model of funding means that you can you know you're not chasing uh traffic for clicks you're not you know you're not desperately trying to get clicks you can instead focus on i mean you still need audiences don't get me wrong you need big audiences and we want big audiences but i think you can but you can also you can put your resources into what your priorities are and i think that's just a decision that all newsrooms make you know what are your priorities and if that's where your priority is then then that's what you target and um we've done that quite successfully in recent years i'll just add very quickly um that um, i'll give a specific example of where marginalized communities in the US, united states have really um i think um felt um, some, af not affinity, but sort of faith in news media. Um, and that is around um, issues of uh, facial recognition and police surveillance. Um, not that there isn't more work to be done, but I'm just thinking about uh, in Los Angeles, where I've worked with a group called Stop LAPD Spying Coalition, there's a lot to complain about in terms of um, the 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 um, lack of coverage and the misrepresentation of both unhoused communities in the Skid Row area, as well as um, uh, 
criticism of the coverage of over-policing, right? There's never enough of uh, contextualizing and history um, in a lot of the media coverage, but at the same time, it has really meant a lot to be able to uh, insinuate the perspective of the community on Skid Row um, into whether it's The Guardian or The Intercept or the BBC or other news outlets, right? Being able to connect with communities and try and um, represent and depict what the struggle is. And that has meant a lot. And I think that um, is, again, not necessarily the, the end point, right? It's a conversation. It's a negotiation between journalists and uh, affected communities, how that representation unfolds and what stories are told. But I think it's a good example of where, um, you know, over a 10 year span of time, this group, for example, the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition has developed relationships with news media in a way that um, has been really productive. So to answer the, the right, <laughs> to, to create time for marginalized communities means actually taking the time <laughs> to have a relationship with marginalized communities and vice versa, right, for mar members of marginalized communities to think about where um, stories can be translated and shared with other um, populations and whether with other audiences um, that can move, you know, these stories in different ways. Thanks, Sita. And I do see all the questions pouring in, <laughs> pouring in now, and we will have to wrap up in a few minutes. Um, I, I actually have missed a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I will go to uh, Mark Doyce's question. Um, a question for Catherine Viner. The Guardian has quite notably taken up specific positions regarding news phenomena such as climate crisis. Do you feel this is an example for other news brands and even individual journalists as so many reporters work as freelancers to follow? Does an explicitly subjective position instill more trust in among audiences? like, as you said, young people, or could it contribute to public polarization? And how does the newsroom navigate this tension? It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question. And um, I think um, I would, I would sort of, I wouldn't characterize it as taking a subjective position. What I'd say is that I think it was, there was a figure now is that I think it's 99.8% of scientists now believe that uh, climate change was, uh, created by humans. So, um, so I wouldn't say it's a subjective position to agree with that. I would say that's um, an objective truth. And so um, just then to say that uh, we think this is a danger uh, to the future of the planet and we will therefore commit a vast number of our reporting resources to that, I don't think that's a, I don't think that is a um, crazily political position. I'd say it's completely uh in line with both the guardian's history and our uh journalistic ethics so i think it's careful not to you know be careful not to think that that's something that it isn't i, I think this is what all the media should be doing i don't think it's just because we're a progressive news organization i think it's what all the media should be doing i think it's the biggest story in the world so um, um i would be i would, I would um be cautious ar around that i think um you know for freelancers taking a um getting strong expertise in a singular area is a really positive thing to do. Um, uh, yeah. Okay, and um, we might just take just one, I'm afraid we've only got time for one or two more quick questions. Um, Sita, um, we have a question here. I might set aside the um, advice on applying for Guardian internships for another time, but thank you for that question. Um, and, um, See, I'm just wondering. We have a question here. What do we need? What do we need to do about the need for big tech? Now, I guess you could interpret that in several ways. Um, but did you want to sort of have a wrap up um, about what we need? To, what do we need to do about the need for big tech? It's here. Yes, it's here, and uh, it's difficult to undo. <laughs> 
Um, I think that uh, earlier I spoke to uh, thinking around the edges of antitrust, right? It's not only that we need to break up big technology. And I would argue that um, there's a, a lot of room to think about um, how we develop public infrastructure um, with respect to computational resources. So by, by that, I mean, right, what are sort of the guts of the computational um, tools that we need and use on an everyday basis? And how can we make that less, you know, if we're talking about virtualized web servers and Amazon, right? Let's not just have AWS to support us, but let's have a range of options or, um, you know, let's think about uh, technologies that um, or, or developing technologies that encourage us to consume less, right? Or the technologies themselves uh, rely on less mining and extraction of rare earth metals, for example, right? I think we need to um, very importantly think about uh, changes in financial regulation that would enable us to curtail the ways that big technology companies are making money for money, right? This process of not just mergers and acquisitions, but the process of finan financialization that has allowed them to grow so um, large. And, and doing some of those things will help it help us arrive at a point where, say, if you're going to, um, you're enrolled in a program uh, in data science or computer science, right? It's going to be the case that you leave university and you don't just have to go work for Alphabet or Amazon or um, other company, right? That there will be, you know, for example, a public agency that is actively in, engaged in developing public computational infrastructure. So those are some of the things that I think will allow us to get beyond this, what, what is an incredibly uh, concentrated big technology ecosystem. Um, there are other recommendations as well, but I, on, on, uh, in general, I'm thinking about sort of structural changes that would allow us to really shift this culture um, so that uh, both we aren't as dependent, uh, but also that we um, are more mindful about the kinds of technology that we're creating and using. Well, that sounds um, like a a whole other panel there, Sita, and some really interesting thoughts. Um, we might just wrap up with just one last uh, question here uh, from Sushi Das. What are your thoughts on the role that fact checkers play in cleaning up misinformation on social media uh, platforms? I suppose it could be argued that, um, as we were saying before, people in certain, you know, polarizing spheres aren't even believing fact checkers as someone said to me what fact checkers are checking the fact checkers <laughs> um so um which is what some people believe so i guess maybe we could wrap up with um with that i mean i think the whole fact checking trend obviously came from a really great place um and but there's just there was a moment uh, it was a couple. It was a couple of years ago. It was when Trump was still in power, and he gave some horrendous speech about something. And um, it was overnight, and I woke up and I saw that the Guardian had fact-checked it, and I thought, oh, that's a good idea. And then I thought, well, I saw the Washington Post had fact-checked it, the New York Times fact-checked, the BBC had fact-checked it, and I realised that all around the world there were all these journalists fact-checking this one speech. And I thought, well, perhaps you just need one person fact-checking, and everyone else going out and finding out what Trump was doing to public lands and what Trump was doing to weaken environmental protections and what Trump was doing on tax. And you know, that maybe that fact checking was a bit of a diversion from finding out the stuff that really mattered. So um, it's important, we need people to do it, but I think, you know, we don't need everybody to do it. And Sita, I don't know if you have any last thoughts on misinformation or anything. Um, just, you know, I, I would absolutely agree. I think um, we should be thinking about different kinds of institutional practices that get us to a point where, um, you know, truth isn't a bad word. <laughs> That's a brilliant way to uh, finish up the panel. 
Um, it's been, uh, we will have to, we do have, thank you, we see all your questions coming in and, um, but we will have to wrap it up now. Thank you for all those questions, they've been terrific. Um, so I just wanted to say, um, you know, I wanted to thank the panellists for addressing this big picture discussion on how media can build a better world post COVID and we've addressed, you know, lots of current and looming crises and across domains, including climate, technological and media challenges and all in just 45 minutes. So uh, I want to thank you both for coming. And just to wrap up in saying the aim of this UTS Media Salon series is to spark global conversations between media professionals and academics, writers, policymakers, thinkers and others on global media issues. Uh, on topics that are both broad and big thinking, or sometimes uh, some panel topics will be more niche. So we'll be continuing into next year, and um, we hope to see you then. And thank you to the panelists and all of you for joining us today, and please join us again next year. Thank you to Catherine and Sita.